Ever feel like you suck at this job? Motherhood, I mean. Have too much anxiety and not enough patience? Too much yelling, not enough play? There's no manual, no village, and no guarantees. The stakes are high. We want so badly to get it right. But this is survival mode. We're just trying to make it to bedtime. So if you're full of mom guilt, your temper scares you. You feel like you're screwing everything up and you're afraid to admit any of those things out loud. This podcast is for you. This is Failing Motherhood. I'm Danielle Batman, and each week we'll chat with a mom ready to be real, sharing her insecurities, her fears, her failures, and her wins. We do not have it all figured out. That's not the goal. The goal is to remind you, you are the mom your kids need. They need what you have, you are good enough, and you're not alone. I hope you pop in earbuds, somehow sneak away, and get ready to hear some hope from the trenches. You belong here, friend. We're so glad you're here. Hey, it's Danielle. Don't you just love that intro? I get so much good feedback on it, and I'm just so proud of it still, like two years later. Ugh. Okay, welcome back. This is part two of a five-part series on parenting strong-willed kids as a worrying warrior parent. And by the end of this series, I really hope that you'll be able to see a comprehensive path to creating confidence and cooperation, the thing we all want, as a parent of a strong-willed child without needing to resort to desperate measures, pulling your hair out, all of the things. And today, what I'm going to talk about is consequences punishments, rewards, all sorts of external motivators, and why they just don't work with strong-willed kids. So if you missed part one, make sure and go back because it explains who I work with and the dynamic between strong-willed kids and their parents, and you might feel really understood and seen as a parent and also just get to know me again a little bit more if you're new to the podcast. So I hear a lot that new listeners will listen to Failing Motherhood from episode one. So whenever you're ending up catching up to this episode, I think it'll still apply because this is universally the work of like three and a half years of my business leading up to this point of being able to truly create a very succinct process and methodology, my wholehearted method to parenting your strong kids with so much more patience with these pillars of cooperation, composure, and core needs, getting you to a place where you are cultivating cooperation over time and just feeling really, really good about it. So that's my goal for you. So again, I am taking a few things from my free training, Authentic and Unapologetic, and breaking them down here on the podcast. So if you haven't dove into that training yet, I highly recommend it. I get so much feedback that The people that watch it feel like I am in their house watching them. (laughs) They feel creeped out because it's like I say the things that they said earlier that day. And that is just the highest compliment because I truly am in your mind. There is so much that binds us together (laughs) as strong-willed kid parents. So in that training, I break down how so many parents end up feeling like worrying warrior parents. And it's so important to me that you understand the beliefs that led them there. So even if your first child is like six months old right now, then you will be able to be on the front end of knowing things and seeing them before they ever begin to be a pattern in your house. So the first belief that I break down is this idea that I hear all the time. I just need to figure out the right consequence or I just need to figure out their currency or what they're motivated by. That way I'll be able to know how to modify their behavior. This has to be one of the biggest myths in parenting. It will drive you crazy, but we can understand why we get to this point, right? Humans are driven to repeat things when they're paired with a reward and avoid circumstances that lead to a negative interaction. 
that seems to be common knowledge. That seems to be what we respond to. So, of course, that makes sense for kids. A plus B equals C. Right? And sometimes it works, or at least the threat elicits a big emotional response, which I can... I guess, depending on your perspective, can seem like working. But let me ask you, is that truly all it takes? Here's what truly happens when you rely on that framework, that belief, to discipline your strong-willed child. Number one, the thing that drives you crazy and why this question even gets asked is because many situations in parenting just don't have a logical consequence to follow that up. If we're trying to look for something that is at all kind of immediate and related and helps them connect the dots between their actions having consequences, so many times there just isn't anything, right? You're just caught in a bind of, yeah, they pretty much can just do refuse or, uh, you know, they're just you would have to make something up in order for there to be a negative consequence for the their lack of cooperation or whatever they're choosing to do in that moment. And it makes you feel so stuck or claustrophobic or put your back against a wall as a parent. And this is when we resort to empty threats and desperate measures and saying things that we never thought we would say as a parent because we just feel helpless. We feel like there is no tool at our disposal at that point if we are relying on this framework of positives and negatives, following up their behavior in this moment of consequence rate after the behavior occurs. It's a trap. If you are a parent of a strong-willed child, you have likely tried timeouts in one way, shape, or form and quickly realized that they may not work for your child. And What that looks like is kind of a charade of chaos where you're chasing them around or you keep trying to restart it when they get up or you're trying to count and negotiate how much time and they won't sit on the step or it doesn't phase them at all. They don't care. They either keep doing it or they go right back to doing it. And again, you feel helpless. You feel trapped. You feel desperate to just, ah, right? I'm like clenching my fist right now. You know how the feeling is of just absolute defiance and having nothing to give back as a result. You may have also realized that it doesn't seem to matter what your threat is or what your bribe is in the moment. Your strong-willed child is very likely to be swayed or deterred or convinced in that moment by those external factors, as in you could promise them Disney World if they would get their shoes on and probably wouldn't change their mind. And you can threaten to take away everything they've ever loved and, again, probably won't change their mind. So if you're looking to figure out the right consequence, there is none. You're trying to figure out something that's the right thing in the wrong category. They aren't motivating in and of themselves to this personality trait, to this type of kiddo and the way that they are wired. They are so sure of themselves. They have such a strong internal compass where they know what they want. It is very backed up by their actions feeling necessary, their actions feeling justified. There really truly isn't much logic and reasoning behind it. So when you try to convince them otherwise – It just doesn't register. If you've ever tried to tell a strong-willed child, hurry up, tell me if it works because it doesn't with mine. The other problem with consequences and rewards on the back end of a behavior is that it's built on the premise that the moment right after a behavior occurs is the most influential moment. And we've been taught that, that that moment is when you have to play your cards right. You have to play a good card or you have to play a bad card to know if that behavior is going to multiply or decrease. The problem with that is you're hoping to teach a lesson when your child is not teachable. As in, if they are at all emotionally flooded 
or knee deep or digging their heels in, they are so single focused. They Their ears aren't open to the feedback. It's like if your husband and you are in the middle of a marriage argument and at that point, at the height of the emotion, you're going to grab a clipboard and a piece of paper and write down all the ways that you can be a better spouse tomorrow. It's not the moment that you're going to be able to take in that feedback. It's just not, right? It can come later, absolutely. But when they're emotionally flooded, they are not teachable. And that's when we're really trying to do the most teaching. And it's pretty likely that if they're not teachable, you're also not in a good place of being a teacher because you are being triggered. You are struggling to contain your own big emotional reaction to what's happening. You are probably pulled in more direction than one and multitasking at the same time of trying to get out the door. It's just not the moment where things are going to fall into place and they're going to realize, oh, you know what? Actually, that's such a good point. I'm going to completely change direction. And next time, this is going to go totally differently. We wish, we think, and it's not how that works. They're also not developmentally capable of the foresight and the higher level thinking it takes to predict what will happen before they act and have the impulse control to make a different choice and then truly understand the ramifications of their actions and be able to take that full responsibility, even if they can verbally express themselves and you think that they should know better. That ability to know better can be super deceiving. And I just saw this on Facebook the other day where it was like, you know, they know how to do this. This is a behavior that like, you know, they know how to clean their room. They know how to express their emotions. They know how to ask for help. Yes. And also, do you as an adult know how to be patient? So therefore, why aren't you patient all the time? It's not for lack of knowing, right? It's because there's so many other factors affecting our behavior in that moment. Same for your child. So trying to boil it down to a simple A plus B equals C formula of behavior plus consequence equals different result next time, that does not work. And I go into a lot of detail in my group coaching program, Wholeheartedly Calm, about what to do instead or what exactly these consequences or that type of a very transactional approach to discipline leads to because there's a lot of results of punishment that are damaging because it's not just what message we're sending. What matters is the child's perception of that message or their lived experience in that moment rather than just our intention. Our intention's are pretty good most of the time, right? We want what's best for them. We're trying to teach them. We're trying to help them. We're acting in their best interest. However, that is not always easily received on the other side. So their lived experience and their perception and the messages they receive in those moments could be something completely different. And that's what actually matters. So if you're not truly intentional about understanding the way that their brain sees the world and the things that they're thinking in that moment to be able to tailor your approach to the child in front of you, then you are really just throwing things into the wind, winging it blind, and just hoping that they get some sort of the message you're trying to send on the, on the as a result. And what I've realized with strong-willed kids is that is just not at all what's happening And that begins to create a wedge of divide and resentment between the two of you over and over and over and over, day after day, especially if they have a sibling and that sibling is getting a different approach and they are seeing that difference and they are taking that personally. Because if they see even like, you know, a new baby that they're getting a lot of attention, that's super common, really, you know, inevitable But let's say they have an older sibling who genuinely doesn't cause a lot of problems, right? And they get compared and they get told, like, why can't you be like so-and-so? 
what is their message they're receiving from that? I'm not good enough, right? And that overarching theme of a pattern of misbehavior and positive discipline that all leads back to a feeling of discouragement. And that discouragement is something that is deeper than just, oh man, I didn't get the red cup I wanted. It's, I'm not good enough. I don't belong. There's something wrong with me. I'll never be good. I guess we'll get good at being bad. And I know if you're a parent listening to a podcast like this, that's not the message that you're trying to send. It may have been a message that you inadvertently got from your parents by the way that they approached you, even though, again, that wasn't their intention. So we see when we become much more aware that there are these deeper themes happening here, we can be much more conscious and intentional and mindful of our approach. And again, the big problem lies in, well, what do you do instead of relying on some of these more tangible, practical, easy to implement things like, let's say the book, one, two, three magic. Please don't read it. (laughs) It basically just says that you approach every single thing without any emotion and you count to three and you put them in timeout wherever you are, whatever the behavior is. That type of formula could be quote unquote easy to implement. I hear from a lot of parents that it's not because it's very hard to be emotionless and follow through on something that is so strict. But there is something really reassuring to something that is so tangible. So you will say, oh, this is it. This is all I have to do. Just repeat it on repeat. And if I just hold consistent, then they'll be fine. However, that is just not how it works. And I'll get more into that in the next episode of this mini series. So I just wanted to be able to crack open maybe a little bit of awareness and poke some holes in maybe some things that you were just maybe believing because that's how you were parented and you haven't thought too much about it or that was the way that your partner was parented. And so that's what you're continuing to do now. But If you know that it's not working, then you're probably open to hearing what else there is. And that is what I share in that free training, Authentic and Unapologetic. And it's also what everyone dives into at great length in my group coaching program, Wholeheartedly Calm, where it combines positive discipline, tools, and communication styles, as well as building your composure and meeting your child's deep core needs so that you actually eliminate the behavior from happening again next time. All right, that's it for today. I will be back next Tuesday with more of this mini series. I hope you are surviving all of the holidays, chaos, the good and the bad and the stress. (laughs) And I hope you're finding little moments that you can create traditions out of. And remember, traditions don't happen, have to happen every year. This year, we started two new traditions. We're creating the Home Alone Lego house, as well as having like our own version of Elf on the Shelf, but it's actually more of like a prank where we hide this creepy toy for other members of our family to find, (laughs) and then you have to hide it for the next person. So you know what? Just make it your own family's brand. Do you. And uh, you know what? I may or may not get Christmas cards out this year, and it's okay. (laughs) Uh, So thank you for taking the time to join me again on this um, bonus episode because these are going to be back-to-back weeks. And if you have other thoughts about what you'd like to see on Failing Motherhood in 2023, if you are one of the devout listeners, if you haven't yet, hit follow so that you can see more of this series to come. But go ahead and let me know. Find me on Instagram and send me a DM and just let me know that you listen to the podcast. That would make me so happy. All right. Have a great rest of your week. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Failing Motherhood. Your kids are so lucky to have you. If you loved this episode, take a screenshot right now and share it in your Instagram stories and tag me. If you're loving the podcast, be sure that you've subscribed 
and leave a review so we can help more moms know that they are not alone if they feel like they're failing motherhood on a daily basis. And if you're ready to transform your relationship with your strong-willed child and invest in the support you need to make it happen, schedule your free consultation using the link in the show notes. I can't wait to meet you. Thanks for coming on this journey with me. I believe in you and I'm cheering you on. Thank you.